you know, they push memoirs in, usually in the literary world, and you're just supposed to think about yourself. But this Lefty writer Greg Gibbs has spent the last 22 years in, in office cubicles. The previous 20 were spent working factories in Minnesota and Illinois. Yeah, it's a, it's a long time to work. During his blue-collar years, Gibbs wrote for labor publications. Two years ago, he published his first novel, Factory Days. This is Democratic Visions. Here's producer Jeff Strait. We talk some about the blue-collar life at the site of the old Ford assembly plant in St. Paul. Yeah. Yeah. You ever seen this before? I have not. This is very uh, spooky, kind of, you know. It is. All the rusted tracks, all the spurs going into the... Uh, I didn't work here. I worked in about six, seven other places in, in Minneapolis. And, and I was thinking about it, and two of them are bulldozed, two of them are office buildings, and then two are still functioning. So that's, uh, you know, that's one-third are still functioning. The other two-thirds are gone. These industrial parks. These tracks would go to Chicago. Milwaukee, yeah, Pittsburgh, yeah, New York. You know, I'm retired now, but I've worked 50 years total, and uh, you know that's enough. Blue collar life is totally different from white collar life, and I saw both sides of the fence. You know, the working fence, so to speak. Uh, for the past 11 years, Greg Gibbs has also commented on the arts, literature politics, film, and class struggles at Mayday Books Blogspot. Greg's book, Factory Days, a splendid work of fiction, can be found on Mayday's shelves. Factory Days is about the blue-collar struggle for survival in the 1980s of Ronald Reagan. The novel is pegged to a guy named Malachy. After Malley's uh, factory shuts down, he becomes a very active activist. Factory Days is uh, about a worker in Chicago named Malachy who uh, gets fired a lot. He uh, loses his girlfriend. He gets kicked out of his apartment. He uh, develops a personal grudge against his boss, and uh, then something happens, you know, and the book involves unions, union meetings, uh, socialist, socialist meetings. Greg Gibbs himself has been a lefty activist in many lefty organizations, including the Peace and Social Justice Writers Group at The Loft. And uh, that's where we met, right? Yep. It's a uh, first writers group I've been in that had politics as one of their interests. So uh, I learned about your book, uh, Factory Days, at that uh, meeting. I actually offered to offer to pay money for it too. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. did. You yeah. did. I was stunned. You were. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about Factory Days. What motivated you, and is it based on your life? I'm I'm not the lead character. Uh, you know, they push memoirs in usually in the literary world, and you're just supposed to think about yourself. But this is partly based on my life, but it's also you know, or my experience. But it's based on the way you work in a in a factory, and the way you think in a factory, and the the kind of people you meet, and the feelings you have. You know, and I think factory people are invisible, in a way. You know, Ralph Ellison wrote Invisible Man about black people. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I think still, you know, rich black people are still pretty visible right now, but the majority of them aren't. And it's the same is true of Latinos and uh, anybody in the working class. These are invisible people, too. I mean. So this is about a, a factory closing, uh, about a particular character. Yeah, and, and I've gone through a lot of factory closings. I've gone through uh, layoffs, and I've been fired a couple times. Uh, Welcome to the club. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's a common experience, and yeah. when it first happens to people, they're they're emotionally stunned, you know. Mm -hmm. And then after it's happened a number of times, you get you understand. Wait a minute, there's a there's a systemic issue here, you know. Even when I was a white collar worker, I got. Uh, uh, laid off or fired they wouldn't tell me sometimes you know and this is what happens in the book the plant is basically shut down in chicago i mean this is a plant i worked in okay so yeah. i can't this is why i can write about it sure and a lot of writers can't because they never worked in these places so you know they have a different experience maybe they went to iowa writers college and <laughs> you know, I don't know, wrote about English professors. But anyway, so, so we got laid off. They got laid off. And they had to process this through the union. You don't ever see a union meeting in a 
work of fiction, or hardly any. I think The Wire had a couple, yeah. but they were, of course, corrupt unionists. This is not corrupt unionists. So th these guys were, uh, you know, trying to deal. How, how do you deal with this closure? Unlike white-collar workers who get fired like that, Somebody shows up, taps them on the shoulders, they come into this room, yeah. and you're out of here in 15 minutes. Yeah. They, ha they have to, especially in bigger factories, they've got to tell people, and so there's a lot of lead time. In that period in Chicago, there were a lot of strikes at Decatur. Mm -hmm. They called it the war zone. There was a big strike of the Chicago Tribune, was it? Yeah. This is back in the this 1980s. This is back in the 1980s. I mean, there was all this turmoil, Caterpillar, Pittston. And this all kind of fits in this period when, uh, you know, workers were really getting kicked uh, pretty hard. You know. And you lived through that. You know, I worked on a lot of strike support committees, and uh, I even interviewed people at Caterpillar for labor papers and stuff, kind of like doing what we're doing now. Sure. You know, and we, we wrote stories about what they were going through. And a lot of those plants moved south. They didn't necessarily move to Mexico. They moved to the south, U.S. south, and a lot of them are there today. Well, Factory Days talks about the relationship of men and women in the factory, the workers, with their bosses, their superintendents, their union stewards, and the owners of the factory. I have not seen this kind of a, a novel in a long, long time. I was glued to it, couldn't put it down, loved it. Your point about being invisible is so true, except you're not invisible to the steward. <laughs> you're not invisible to the foreman. You're not invisible to your, the people on the line. You know, you're real human beings. Yep. And when you get laid off, what do you do? Sure, you have union support, but if the whole factory goes, there may not be another option around. Last day at the factory was not all that eventful. It was quiet, blessedly quiet. Most men are not sentimental and they had scheduled no party afterwards as no one felt like it. They said their goodbyes carefully as many would not see each other ever again. The chosen few, the chosen brown noses or the quiet ones, would never open their mouth or the relatives who were staying with the shrunken new company tried to remain invisible, tried to become very small just limp handshakes looking at people just to the side of their eyes. The ones who were leaving carefully went through their workbenches for personal items and slid a few company tools in their bags. It was expected. The infamous large checks were handed out for staying up to this point and this brightened the day for most. Dicker, the union lead man, did most of the honors. They tried to remember all those that had already gone. They'd remember dozens of men who had worked and talked and joked, been fired or injured, been laid off at the factory. Five years or ten years of life had gone on in this huge concrete block box and now it was to end like the end of a war or a family. Uh, do you m miss the the human uh, culture and community of, of working in factories? Yeah because if you work in a white-collar environment you know you're on your own people are more careerist more individualist there's no mostly there's no unions so there's nothing uniting people so you can't trust people quite as much, you know, and it depends on your, on your workplace, the ones I've seen anyway, and not uh, very collective. In the factories that you worked in, was there any kind of competition between your peers for different positions or jobs or promotion no. to a... And you, you, can, you can see it in the, in the book, people are just, there's kind of splits between, you know, higher paid workers and lower paid workers mm -hmm. because they're, they're uh, you know, some of them are more skilled and less skilled, supposedly, even though every job is so absolutely you've got to have skills and know what you're doing. And Books the, in the 1980s, not, yep, not, yep, not it, now. Yeah, we hadn't, yeah, everybody hadn't been creamed yet. No one builds memorials to close factories or bulldoze factories. No one makes movies about what happened there. Factories are, at best, used as backdrops for people with more interesting lives, like superheroes, doctors, or cops. No one writes about that concentrated small life, that microhistory, disappears into oblivion as if it never happened, as if it is not worth remembering except to the people who went through it. If people in that life, their work, and let's face it, their lives are not thought significant enough to remark upon, 
like the hidden gears of a great machine, they're as invisible as people can be. And it doesn't matter what their color or ethnic background is. They are the truly invisible men. They are the invisible people. And one of the big strikes in here is the P9 strike in Austin, Minnesota, and that was a huge thing in the labor movement here. Remind people what that strike was. Well, that was against Hormel, uh, the, the makers of Spam, and <laughs> they, uh, they wanted to cut wages and increase the speed of the line, and everything in the union went out on strike. That's in the book. Malachy, he's an everyman, right? Yeah. But he runs into these leftists, and uh, they haul them all off to you know, Austin, and uh, and this was a big event even here in Minneapolis. Sure. It, uh, I th there were a whole group was formed around uh, the Austin P9 strike. So it, uh, you know, I don't think I've read a fictional fiction of anything about Austin. I've read Peter Ratchliff's book, you know, which is a history, but it's not fiction. You know, and all these these strikes and struggles and all these things extended from Chicago and up into Minneapolis and and all well all over the country. You know, I mean they were going on. Now we read these days that people don't appreciate unions so much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know young people are starting to turn towards unions. Uh, essentially the workforce is got a better chance now for unionism than in the past. In Chicago is the biggest warehouse area in the United States. There's thousands of warehouse workers, thousands of drivers and teamsters and, and yet they're not all organized, and if they got organized, it would be huge because, you know, it's not River Rouge, but it's... it's uh, <laughs> River Rouge is an automotive plant in Detroit. Yeah. Ford, it's, it's a Ford company plant. Yeah, it was the biggest one in the world. Yeah, and now, is that closed now? Yeah, and it now the Chinese plant in uh, Guangdong is the biggest in the world. You know, the, A Ford the, producer? Y y well, they make Apple products and stuff okay. like that, but <laughs> I can't remember their name. But, but the thing about this is that, yeah, writers don't write about this stuff. These were kind of common interests back in the 30s and 40s. And in fact, there's a whole list of writers that we, everybody knows. Yeah, Jack yeah. London, Upton Sinclair, Frank Harris, Theodore Dreiser, Alice Medley, Mike Gold, B. Traven, John Steinbeck. Uh, Richard Wright, uh, John Dos Passos, James T. Farrell, Tilly Olson, Ed Dahlberg. These were, it was a huge movement of writers, but right at the war, this kind of current kind of ended it. And then there was the McCarthy period, and the unions changed, and you know, even here in Minnesota, the left was thrown out of the Farmer Labor Party, and, and a whole, the unions changed, and literature changed too, you know, a uh, different kind of literature came in. So I'm trying to revive that tradition. You made a great start at it. This book kind of ends up in Minnesota and the Boundary Waters. Well, there's a reason for that. You know, if you look back in, in literature, if you look back in the Civil War, slaves escaped to Canada. They didn't go, I mean, they went to the northern United States, but uh, you know, John Brown was ferrying them up across Lake Champlain into Canada, because mm -hmm. that's where they were really safe. Sinclair Lewis wrote, it can't happen here, and the rear area of the fight against fascism in the United States was in Canada. And then you have The Handmaid's Tale now, where the people are escaping from the United States to go to Toronto. And the draft resistors, many of them of my generation, went up to Canada. I was lucky not to get drafted. Now, Greg, Malachy's second trip to Minnesota uh, finds himself on a desperate snowmobile escape from Ely through the Quetico into Ontario. Now, in Ely, he had met Alice Walker. Not, not that Alice Walker. Uh, this Alice Walker is a computer lab technician. She's an African-American. Malachy had also met John in Ojibwa, a convenience store clerk in Mottawa, a bus stop town. Now, Greg, would you agree that Malachy, the factory worker, the Native American, and the African American, knew they were among America's invisible, right? Right, and I think, uh, you know, this is, this is inbuilt to most people who aren't prominent, you know, and the majority of people in the country aren't prominent. Alice was kind of a reject in her town, or because she was uh, African American, uh, you know, Ely's a pretty white place, and he was a city boy, and it's a rural town, so he was 
kind of a reject, so they, they uh, kind of saw eye to eye on that. And he actually learned things from her, you know, which is the reverse of what we're supposed to believe. The scene with John in the, uh, in the deli. It was a short scene. He's not an important character in the book, but it had resonance. He is the guy who introduces Maliki to Native American in the North. He understands that there's something going on with this guy uh, who is on this bus. And, uh, you know, Maliki is kind of a city boy who doesn't know that much. And now he's finding out, wait a minute, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not in Kansas anymore, you know. Factory Days is self-published by Greg Gibbs through Outskirts Press. Yeah, it's published by Outskirts Press, and it's what? on Amazon and also Barnes & Noble. So it's part of the democratization of writing. Gibbs injects his novel with the dark humor of class struggle, trying to make rent, and getting blindsided by the boss and multinational conglomerates. Kindle versions of Factory Days can be ordered online from a number of the usual suspects. You know who they are? But for God's sake, buy the book from a real store. Tell me Thanks. about your blogging. Uh, you, you review movies. Yeah, review movies. I just reviewed The Post, you know, from kind of yeah. a lefty What did you think of, of The Post? Yeah, well, the funny part is the New York Times had this Pentagon Papers before The Post. But yeah. The whole movie's about The Post. But the, be the best part of that movie is that it shows how close Catherine Graham and... Uh, you know, uh, was it Ben, ben Bradley? Ben were Bradley, yeah. to Kennedy, to Johnson, to to uh, McNamara, yeah. And so these were personal friends. So when they were deciding to publish this stuff, it was like they were doing something against their friends, you know. And to me, that was revelatory because you know you don't really hear about how journalists are so close to the people in power. There's just a funny yeah. survey that just came about. Uh, they say the Wall Street Journal and New York Times, most of them come from Harvard and Yale, most of them, the majority. And that includes the New Republic. And, oh, really? And, and then the rest of them are, are, are uh, you know, they're not land-grant institutions they're coming out of. They're coming out of, uh, you know, the S Seven Sisters and, the, and the, you know. The what, what else uh, do you like to uh, blog about? Well, I, I do fiction reviews. I just reviewed a book on uh, Russia during the Stalin period uh, by a guy named Rybakov. It's a fictional thing and partially fiction. And mm -hmm. then uh, I also do nonfiction. I'm going to be reviewing Kim Moody's book on the labor movement okay. and what's changed in the labor movement. So I kind of get a broad range of things. It's not just academic stuff or just pop stuff. It's kind of mm -hmm. everything, you know. Uh, Greg, tell me why there aren't uh, so many factory days type books right now. Well, I, I think it's what I call the literary mafia, which, of course, we know is headquartered in New York, <laughs> like Wall Street. But uh, it's also got a branch here in Minneapolis. Uh, the Loft, uh, I've got stories about them, not just that the, they're kind enough to allow us to meet there. That's nice. The Star Tribune, NPR, and Talking Volumes, and they all kind of promote a certain kind of literature. Uh, I actually just heard Carrie Miller this morning, uh, and it probably isn't the morning that you're hearing this, but uh, Arundhati Roy is going to be here tomorrow. And I've got tickets. I'm going to write a review about it. And uh, she just finished a novel called The Ministry of Utmost Happiness, which is, of course, an uh, irony because it, it's not. Sure. It's about India. And uh, Carrie Miller introduced it and didn't mention the politics in her book, because Erin Doughty Roy is a very left-wing writer, and she just talked about, you know, the wonderful imagery. And the, but it's really about the uh, Muslim uh, oppression in India by the Hindu majority. Yeah. And so it centers on Kashmir and all these things. But anyway, my point is that Carrie Miller didn't mention that in her little blurb. Now, what happens when Erin Doughty Roy shows up? and tries to talk politics while Carrie Miller wants to wax ecstatic about language alone. Uh, we'll <laughs> see how that goes. But, you know, they, they promote, uh, I would call them memoirs, like the, especially they sell this to women. Write your memoir. You know, and the, the fact is, is most people's lives aren't really that interesting. My life isn't, uh, you know, 
my mother's might have been, but my brother's isn't. I don't, you know, I, most people don't really have enough to have a real memoir. So why do they tell people this? And you got these guys like running with scissors, Augustine Burroughs, you know, he's a, mm -hmm. you know, dysfunction is, they love dysfunction. And so this is the kind of things they push on people, kind of personal individualist stories and not a broader social palette uh, and uh, political palette, especially a working class palette. That's almost invisible. And you, although, you know, Cheryl Strayed wrote a book called Wild and she's from Minnesota. And, and the people, reason people like it is because she actually hiked the Pacific Coast Trail. And so that everybody could identify with that, but not with her alcoholism and her drug addiction and her sexual problems. But nobody had walked the Pacific Coast Trail, so people liked that memoir because it was really not a memoir. It's like a travel story. Yeah. But, you know, and these are the kind of things to me the literary mafia push. They push apolitical kind of stuff. So. And, and they, they make things nice and pretty. Sometimes that's what it is. That's what I get from Minnesota Public Radio, uh, you know. Well, how do they make things pretty? Well, they don't ask the tough questions yeah. about the politics, about yeah. the real suffering, yeah. about the the dirtiness and, and, and you know, the, the, some I, of the stuff you talk about in, yeah. in factory days. Yeah. Um, uh, and then there's another, there's another thing about the literary muffin. It's called MFA programs. And one of my favorite authors is the What's guy. What's an MFA? Yeah. It's a Master's of Fine Arts, and especially yeah. the Iowa Writer School is the top one in the country. Sure. Now, my, one of my favorite writers is the guy who wrote The Sympathizer. Called, uh, his name is Viet Tian Nguyen. Yeah. And he's been smashing MFAs all over the country. Because if you look at who graduates from these things, they're very expensive. And it's a very select group, and actually the writers that come out of it, uh, I don't even know a lot of them. So, and I read a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. now, I might not be reading the right books, so maybe sure. that's true. Yeah. There's very few writers that come out of these F MFA programs that people can remember and uh, that actually talk about work. They almost never talk about working class people or working class or social issues. So this is, again, it's a, like a factory that churns these guys out, these people out for a very high price. And they're lauded and, you know, but. They that, win state book awards and things that, like that. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. But as, as Viet says, they're not very good writers. And he, he learned on his own. He was an autodidact. And I am also an autodidact. So What's you know, an autodidact? You teach yourself. Okay. And a lot of people on the left are autodidacts. They study history, they study economics, they study all this stuff. Because they, you never learn it in the college. <laughs> <laughs> These are people who don't have enough in them to write, a, write anything because, and they've got to go and be taught how to do it. And, <laughs> and I, you know, uh, there's many, many writers who did not go to MFA school. Sure. That's, and I, I think the majority. Minnesota politics, run with it. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I, I'm I'm a socialist, okay. Yeah. But I, poor Mr. Dayton is the guy holding this whole avalanche back, and and I pity him because because you know he's he's probably the last one standing before a bunch of anti-union, anti-working-class uh, stuff comes down the pike. And I appreciate that, but then you have to think about how did we get to this place? And you know, I don't want to get into that too much, but obviously, you know, the Democratic Party has made some deep errors to get to the point where he's holding back the flood. And uh, you know, hopefully, there's going to be a revival, you know, of politics. Uh, you know, I don't know if it'll go into the Democratic Party. I know the Sanders people are in there mm -hmm. trying to plug away and. Uh, but I mean, we're in a, we're going to be like the next domino, like Wisconsin to fall, and think from so, kind of the southern right to work for less kind of politics. And uh, you know, unless something really, really changes, and you know, well, so. what would, what would that change be, and how, where do you think it's going to come? Well. I mean, I, I, w I used to be a member of the Labor Party, and yeah. we had about a third of the unions. 
in the whole country in the Labor Party, and this was in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of came out in the opposition to NAFTA. Yeah. But they didn't run candidates because the AFL-CIO uh, basically, you know, Sweeney threatened uh, uh, the head of the, you know, the head of the Labor Party and said, if you guys run candidates, we're going to throw you out, you know. So they, they lost their nerve. But to me, you know, that's what we have to do, kind of have a, a labor, a labor-based organization, but bring in everybody, you know, who's, sure. who's unhappy right now. How can so. they relate to the DFL? Uh, well, I mean, I went and voted for Sanders in the primary. Totally, we swamped, we swamped the, <laughs> the, the precinct. It was ridiculous. The poor soul running it. One guy, he didn't, the box wasn't big enough for the ballots, you know. Uh -huh. yeah, there were people out lined up in the snow. Where's your precinct? Yeah, it's, it's in the, it's in the Howe neighborhood, um, you know, on the south side of Minneapolis, okay. south, east, west side. Sanders took Minnesota. It didn't matter though. What should DFLers do about what should DFLers do? I think things are so bad on the environmental front, the labor front, the war front that a real deep change has to happen. I wish the Farmer Labor Party was still here, and it's not. And you yeah. know that's the old days. And the, there's a lot of leftists who are nostalgists. You know, they just want to think about the good old days in the 30s. And uh, honorary dinner with Hubert's name on it. And yeah, you know, let's have a rally with a Wellstonian feeling. Yeah, to it, well, you know? well, Wellstone always showed up at labor stuff. Uh, you know, and he was. He was anti-war, and he, he had a hard line, you know, and he, he stuck to it when he made a lot of enemies in the, you know, among the Republican, you know, party and sure. among the Democrats, some Democrats even, so. Well, Greg, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jeff, for having we me. We get a thumb. How well, do we do this? What's well, the labor? What's the well, labor? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Gee. Democratic Visions is handcrafted by volunteers from Eden Prairie, Hopkins, Edina, Minnetonka, and Bloomington. Watch us on select cable systems and on our YouTube channel. This is Carol Sundstrom.